bust, which fits closely, more closely to the Hindu uh, worldview. Um, apparently, this uh, cosmolo cosmologist is in line, possibly for a Nobel Prize. I find that very interesting, the idea that there is no singularity, there is no Big Bang, it's a constant uh, expansion and collapse. Based on that, my first question is, great, what happened before that? And if we get out of the time question, well, it has to begin somewhere. We, we're stuck in time, so somebody help me out with figuring that. Uh, my second comment was, um, pardon my little uh, phone here, um, was there's also some emerging evidence on uh, biochemistry, uh, brain chemistry, and duration of uh, people who meditate and people who pray. Uh, there are limited data coming in, but there's been some brain studies on people who, who spend extended time in prayer at least two hours a day or in meditation at least two hours a day seem to have experiences in sections of the brain that are relevant to selfless uh, consciousness. Um, my curiosity here is that sounds very interesting to dehumanize uh, our existence to a bunch of chemicals. So I don't know if I said too much, but if each of you could just comment briefly on both, I'd be interested to hear what you Perhaps think. Perhaps I could take the honors this time. Uh, your first question was about the oscillating universe again. Speculative. I look forward to, you know, cosmologists seeing if they can converge on a theory that best fits fresh evidence. Um, on the business of the study of spirituality through brain states, uh, on the naturalistic hypothesis, it is much easier to explain how rich experiences, both aesthetically of beauty and wonder of the world around us, and also the joys, perhaps blisses, of internal meditation, these are all connected to the brain. In other words, on the naturalistic hypothesis, you would expect to see brain changes where there are mental changes. A dramatic scientific discovery that in fact mind can float free from body would be evidence of dramatic mental changes where absolutely no significant brain changes can be detected by science. That has not yet happened, right? That evidence has not yet come forth. So I think the balance of evidence points toward the naturalistic claim that mind and body are deeply connected and then there are various flavors of naturalism that can explain why and how that can happen, complexities that are perhaps inappropriate here. But that's all I had to say about those two points. Uh, the general point about consciousness is very interesting. I could have included in my argument. Uh, it's not true that uh, affirming a deep connection between the mental and the brain is naturalistic. That's an assumption that naturalists make, but then they have to say more than that. They have to say that either uh, the mental and the physical are identical, or they have to believe that the mental supervene on or uh, somehow occur because of the physical, but there's no causation from the mental to the physical. Most naturalists would deny that. Um, so they hold to an identity theory of mind and body, or they hold to an epiphenomenalist theory. But this concerns a problem in philosophy that's called the explanatory gap problem, and that is the problem of trying to explain the gap between conscious experiences and physical states in the brain. It doesn't even have to be about prayer or meditation. It can be looking at a, an object of the color blue, and you see blue, and you have this consciousness of this color. Um, he said that we don't have any evidence of minds floating free of bodies, but <laughs> on his view, what could count as evidence? Uh, what could count as evidence of minds floating as bodies on his view? Um, thankfully, our bodies are connected with minds, and it is with our minds that we, exer we, we uh, do things with our bodies. Uh, I didn't get into anything about how a uh, non-physical being like God could perform physical acts, but we are, I believe, immaterial souls that have bodies. And we do it ourselves as finite creatures. We have intentions that come from our minds, and we're able to raise our arms, if we will, and have the power to do it, and so forth. So consciousness is itself a serious problem for naturalism, and easier to explain on, an, on a theistic view, where God is the ultimate mind. So far in this debate, uh, I've not seen either of you insult each other with petty names. 
I've never seen you strike each other in anger. <laughs> I've never seen you commit murder. And uh, I believe that both of you have had your opinions for more than a year, more than five, more than ten. So it seems that whether or not you believe God exists doesn't change your actions. And if I can make an assumption, I'm pretty sure that both of you know at least one person who has died, right? So it seems that whether or not you believe in God doesn't change what's going to happen to you or those around you. So what I wonder is whether or not you believe in God, if we can prove that he, she, it exists or doesn't, what bearing does it have on our own lives? Uh, I'd be really wrong and I'd have to tell everybody so. If, I mean, right? If it could be proven that these arguments actually provide far weightier evidence than um, any uh, naturalistic explanation, I would uh, be very intrigued by what else religion has to say. My course hasn't been one of steady dogmatic assertion, but rather a gradual, interesting intellectual uh, path where I started out knowing, as most college freshmen do, not much about science and certainly not much about the complexities and varieties of naturalism. And there are varieties. There are more, perhaps not as popular today, than those that Doug mentioned, but there are. And there are lots more to learn about human morality and how human beings can intelligently work together to improve our moralities. We've been at this a long time, if you will, if it needs a name, it might be called ethical thinking. Great religions do a great deal of ethical thinking. It's not a coincidence that Jesus, Buddha, Confucius, the list could go on, are exceedingly concerned with getting large groups of people to converge on very important ethical uh, principles so that we can solve the problems of uh, uh, civilizations on this planet. And this process continues, and I'd like to be a part of it. Uh, well, believing a proposition is not going to determine whether or not there is such a thing as immortality, for example. But if you believe in immortality and you're right, well then, you'll, you'll, have, you'll experience immortality. There may be conditions for experiencing immortality of one form or another. And that could have a lot to do with the way you live your life in the present, in the present time. So I do think that whether you believe in God, what you believe about God, and how serious you are in believing about God in terms of living your life can make a huge difference to the way you live and uh, the way you raise your children and the way you relate to other people and the way you prepare yourself for the afterlife that you think is coming. Uh, it would be quite different for me, I should say, if, uh, if I didn't believe that. So. Yes, I think it's a deadly serious issue if it turns out that the, conviction, the, the commitments we make morally and ethically and related to God uh, make a difference to our eternal destiny. I have heard a hypothesis that uh, some people have said that nothing is unstable, and I think nothing is a kind of incomprehensible as infinity, which where we'd have nothing. And so some people have put forward the theory that if, when you start with nothing, that the laws of probability and the laws of math demand that all possibilities, all possible universe would come into being. Now, you can comment on that any way you want to, but one aspect I would like to see both of you deal with, if the laws of math are responsible for bringing, and laws of probability are responsible for bringing everything into existence, would that be defined as a as a uh, transcendent cause? Or would that be defined as a naturalistic cause? Uh, there's a bit of amb ambiguity in the question, so I'm unsure how to answer. But I think I will answer it, and you can pass the microphone to the next person. When you speak of these mathematical laws or probabilistic laws, the word law can be a bit ambiguous. It might refer to some sort of regular habit of energy transformation or some physical constant that's continually obeyed. Or it might mean a law in the purely mathematical sense where you're talking about relationships between mathematical entities that do not themselves exist. In the second sense, I'm not sure that 
purely mathematical entities, laws, relationships, equations, uh, could produce anything physical. There's a dramatic gap of the sort that I've claimed exists between a supernatural divinity and a physical uh, universe. If, however, you meant laws about things, energies, powers, forces, what have you, that are responsible for creation, then we're simply sort of talking about using nature to explain more nature. And I think we've already sort of adequately debated the, the merits and demerits of, of that approach, although I could be wrong. D Doug, you might. Well, it does sound to me uh, like y y when you raise the notion of nothingness and, and say that there are some who think of that as something that's unstable, uh, then you're talking about the view that there, there is something there and then mathematics and logic somehow uh, work such that you can get all kinds of possibilities and maybe several at the same time. Is that part of the view? Okay. Well, then it sounds to me like these probabilistic laws are laws of logic, but they're not operating on anything physical or concrete. And the laws themselves are causally inert. They don't make things happen. They're just too abstract. And I agree with John that the mathematical relations would be the same. You relate uh, two numbers using an operator like the plus sign, and you get 2 plus 2 equals 4. But there isn't a 2 and a 2 and an operator and a 4. Uh, necessarily. Uh, but if there are, now some people believe that numbers exist, but even those who believe that they exist believe that they are abstract objects and therefore causally inert. So they're not going to make anything happen either. Uh, my view is that nothing is nothing and that there's nothing about nothing that gives it content. Hi, my name is Bob. Um, I'm a non-believer, used to be a believer. Um, the longer I stood in this line, the stupider my question seemed to be. Uh, what time is it? <laughs> no, not, that's not the question. Uh, that's probably a good question. I, I guess I was thinking, what if I was this, this life form that came from another planet? I go to this debate where they're talking about, does God exist? First thing I want to know is, what is God? What is God? other than a word. What is God? Well, I, I told you what I meant by God without using the word God. I gave a description, and then I said, this is what I mean by God, and I'm going to use that word for that, that description, right? A timeless, um, immaterial or spaceless, personal being of great power and intelligence who created the universe and sustains it in existence. That's a pretty elaborate description uh, to which the term God refers in the context that I'm using it here tonight. Now, your ETI is an interesting uh, case. We, we, I don't know why we assume that extraterrestrial intelligences wouldn't come to us and say, good grief, you don't believe in God? We've always believed in God. Please, next question. In your first statement, one of your major arguments seems to be that the universe seems to be designed to suit human beings. And since you're a sophisticated theologian, I assume that you accept the theory of evolution in which we would adapt to our environment. And from a solipsistic viewpoint, I can see how that would look like the universe was designed for us. But since we came after the universe, um, why wouldn't we be simply adapting to it? OK. Well, I'm not a theologian, all right? My theologian friends would probably uh, want me to emphasize that, okay? Um, no, my field is philosophy, but uh, what I, I guess what I want to say is, well, look, um, evolution doesn't really have to enter into this discussion, and it hasn't. I guess you noticed that it hasn't really entered into the discussion all that much. Um, first life is something that comes much later in geological history and the uh, interaction of chemicals in the physical universe. So if there is reason to believe that God exists because there's an origin of the universe, there's a parent design that would not be as well explained otherwise, uh, first life itself is not, has not yet been explained, there is no uh, really compelling theory that's got scientists really excited right now about how life began. Uh, 
I was in the natural mu the the, the uh, natural history museum, I guess it is, in New York City, and there was a spiral walkway showing uh, the history of the physical universe from the Big Bang up to the present time. And I said to my daughter, "Let's see what it says about where they mark off the origin of life." We looked there, and it said somehow life began at this time. Somehow, that's pretty much where we are still today. Um, I think God is a good, a good explanation for that. Now, what happened later? I don't know. Consciousness itself is something peculiar to the physical universe. So certainly, we're, we're, if we exist, and God intended this universe to have the properties that it does, and it, it, we wouldn't otherwise exist, then there is reason to think that we matter to God. And so there's nothing solipsistic about it. It's not even selfish. And then if God condescends to reveal himself in special ways, then we have even better reason to think that he cares. Uh, Doug is quite right that a complete theory of the origin of the first self-replicating uh, organic molecules on the planet is not yet confirmed by you know, any confident body of uh, uh, scientists. However, it's a bad bet to bet against science. There was a time not so long ago when every volcano required a god to cause it. Yes, there are mysteries that remain in the universe, but already even life is starting to succumb to the various sciences. Scientists are recently discovering how given simple, uh, uh, simplest organic molecules that would have been here on the earth anyway can actually start to assemble under, again I stress, conditions that we were fairly confident existed. This is not anything like a complete theory, but we continue to see the forward marching progress of science that is driving the God hypothesis right out of the natural world and is still lingering uh, on the dark fringes and edges of human knowledge. Please, next question. As a uh, non-religious fundamental Christian, I gather my strength and my beliefs through scripture. And this question is directed to John. John, how is it that prophecy in Scripture and the fulfillment of that prophecy at later dates in Scripture, how is that explained from your world perspective? Uh, there have been no successful serious prophecies in Scripture or anywhere else. Alleged prophecies, for example, citing uh, Old Testament sources that are allegedly about New Testament events are highly interpreted, dubious translations from the Hebrew, and interestingly, always invented hundreds of years after Christianity had already consolidated itself. For example, this business of resorting to mention of Emmanuel, you know. Uh, yeah. The word, the word Emmanuel actually isn't in any of the uh, three synoptic Gospels. This is later Christians trying to show desperately some connection between the Old Testament God and the New Testament God and stretching translation and credibility to try to find a few highly suspected, uh, suspicious, alleged prophecies. Um, I'm not confident that there's any solid evidence of serious scriptural prophecy. One last point. If God had really wanted to use scripture, had really wanted to use prophets to really prove something impressive, where's the line in the Old Testament that says the moon has craters? Where's the old line in the Old Testament that says Jupiter has moons? Where's the line in the Old Testament that says you can uh, take simple compounds and create uh, clear glass? The, uh, you know, God had plenty of opportunities to make some serious prophecies that could be verified we don't see them. Instead, we see a collection of interesting stories that is easily explained entirely in terms of the cultural traditions. Nothing supernatural here required. Well, the, an interesting final point. Uh, several things. Uh, the Old Testament scriptures do refer to the circumference of the earth. There are some other things that are of interest. There are archaeological findings, civilizations referred to in the Old Testament that weren't known, like the Hittite civilization that was... Uh, not known to exist. That's not prophecy, but it uh, it shows that there are sciences, even in their uh, new development, that are corroborating some of the things that are in the scriptures. But I think it's more important to notice this. First of all, 
even if you couldn't prove that a prophetic claim was fulfilled by a certain statement, it wouldn't follow that that is not a fulfillment of the prophetic claim. In other words, a prophet could prophet, prophet, uh, prophesy something could happen that does fit the description, and the skeptic could say, yeah, but that could have just happened. Fine, but it also could have been fulfillment of prophecy. That's one thing. You can't just automatically throw uh, prophecy out as something that happens just because you can't confirm that it did happen in that case. Uh, second, it, I think we should be wary of using uh, prophecy and alleged fulfillments of prophecy as a, a hard-boiled defense of the authority of Scripture simply because there are only limited cases where it is going uh, to be uh, possible to really produce the right kinds of strict guidelines. Um, the one that interests me the most is written about in a book that I co-edited. I did not write the chapter. I don't have the qualifications to. But in a book that I edited called In Defense of Miracles, there's a chapter on prophecy by Robert Newman. And I would encourage anybody here, the, the questioner, for example, interested in this question, maybe take a look at that chapter. Maybe John should take a look at that chapter. It would be interesting to see if he thought that maybe there is more to that particular instance of prophecy than, than he believes. But, um, again, the main thing here is that you can't deny that prophecies occurred simply because you can't confirm that something was the fulfillment of a prophecy. I'm actually going to change my question. You had mentioned the Hittites. Yeah. So the Hittites were one of the seven nations in, in the Bible who were inhabitants of Canaan who were marked for genocide. They were, they were one of the seven, along with the Canaanites and others, that the ancient Israelites were commanded to destroy, and it went into substantial detail in how to destroy. Mm -hmm. Men, women, ch children, cattle, property, art, etc. I use that as an example to ask, you had made in your argument that altruism could not have occurred, or unlikely to have occurred naturally, and the faculties that we had, our uh, moral inclinations are probably godly derived. But then when you actually look at the Bible, and as a Christian, I assume you'd use also the Old Testament as a source of, of, of uh, God's intention, you see not only random events like volcanoes and floods that occur where we have to say why, we also see commandments ostensibly being given by God to commit genocide and other crimes of that nature. So if we leave aside the natural tsunamis and things of that nature, could you, could you explain how you look at the Bible as a source of relevant morality and in essence a, a reflection of God's morality in terms of how we use that body of, of literature as God's instruction to, to inform our conduct? Yeah. Well, the first thing to notice, uh, to note, is that we've wandered from our topic, right? Our question uh, tonight is, does God exist? And is there anything answering to the description of God that I gave in my definition? What interests me is, uh, why is it that atheists ask uh, questions about the Bible without being prepared to take seriously the evidence for the existence of God, whether or not the Bible is the Word of God, right? See, uh, it may not be the Word of God. It wouldn't have to be for God to exist. And so the evidence for God's existence could be just as compelling as it is, regardless of what you make of the authority of Scripture. So we have to make that clear tonight, because that's why we're here, to talk about God and reasons to believe there is a God. Now, when it comes to, um, to, this, to this particular part of Scripture, there's no question that it is uh, counterintuitive that we could be justified in doing that sort of thing. Now, uh, Notice this is commanded under certain conditions that aren't replicated in history. Uh, if it's commanded at all, there are actually uh, there are actual conservative scholars who uh, think that uh, this is not a command from God, but it is construed as a command by the people themselves, mistakenly so. That's one of the views, actually. Uh, another uh, interpretation is that. Uh, when they invoke the idea that uh, God, God gave us this victory and we did his will, it's like, 
fitting into the uh, ethnic and cultural context among all the nations where they would appeal to their gods as uh, the rationale for what they did. And they'd say, you know, our team beat your team, that kind of thing, and we beat you by, you know, this huge margin when it might have been by one touchdown. Uh, so there, there are various interpretations that you can't, you, you assume. Stop, the time is up. You assumed a particular interpretation. Uh, just very briefly, I'm delighted when Christians critically examine, try to carefully interpret, and selectively obey their own scripture. This supports the naturalistic hypothesis that, in fact, humanity is capable of knowing right from wrong and that progress in morality and ethics has occurred I doubt very few Christians today would look at various passages in the Old Testament and say, yeah, that's my savior. Uh, no. So I think we have to be careful looking to old scripture to accuse present-day Christians who are far more humanistic and much more like atheists than anyone was back then. Um, Before we take the next question, I just need to ask technically our filming people, do we need to stop to change the tape or are we all right? Okay, keep going. A, a separate practical question. May I suggest 9.30 is an absolute time stop to avoid fatiguing okay. everyone? Okay, what we will do then is uh, only those in line, we will ask no one further to line up if that's okay. Um, gentlemen almost uh, took what I was going to ask. Uh, if you look at the Bible, you look at Numbers 31, and Moses has a battle with the Midianites. His soldiers come back, and Moses says, did you kill the women and children to the generals? The generals say no, and he says, what's wrong with you? You've got to go out and kill all the children, all the male children, and all the female children who are virgins. You can spare them and distribute them. Now, uh, and then in Deuteronomy uh, 13 and 20, we're told that if somebody comes to your relative and says, don't believe in God, you should kill them. In John 15:6, it says, if you don't accept Christ, you should be put into a fire like a burning bush. And the interesting thing about Moses is this, if he was living today, he'd be called a war criminal. But you put him in the Bible, and everybody worships him, Jews, Muslims, Christians. I have Muslim relatives who tell me, well, Moses wasn't really Jewish. He was really a Muslim. So couldn't we say that even if there is a natural force, the Mohammed, the Mohammedan Jewish Christian version of it, is pretty uh, sick, as Steven Weinberg said this morning. Um, and there are many, quote, there are I, many I, phrases in the I, Koran I that say the same uh, thing. I think you're covering similar territory as the previous gentleman, and I think my answer to that gentleman stands for yours as well. Uh, Doug might want to add some more. No. Next questioner, please. I'll try again. I'm willing, to, it is my suspicion that once you posit that everything that exists has a cause. No, that not what I said. Third time. Say it again. It's not everything that exists has a cause. What did you say? Everything that is an event or begins to exist, which is a kind of event, that has a cause. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. Once you posit that, it is my, I suspect that you will inevitably end up with the, with, with coming up with a transcendent God, such as a transcendent cause such as God. Mm. I agree. What I wish to say is, is that we have many, many things that begin to exist that for which we do not know the cause. We don't have to wait for an answer from quantum mechanics. We know right now that quantum mechanics has many such things for which it does not know a cause. Does not know a cause or does not have a cause? Either. Well, that's going to No, we far. don't know that it doesn't have a cause. We don't know a cause. Well, that's so that this is a, uh, I want to say that this idea that everything that begins to exist have a cause is an article of faith. Well, okay. There are a couple of ways that philosophers uh, explain the rationale for the principle of causality that I've invoked here. One is uh, empirically by noting that there is zero, zero evidence uh, for any event that does not have a cause. Okay? That's an empirical uh, argument. And there are, I mean, I think it's a perfectly reasonable claim that uh, if, if we've never observed an event that we know to have no cause, then uh, we're within our rights to believe that events have causes. Uh, it actually, science depends upon that. 
And uh, it's one reason why quantum mechanics continues to be a going concern, because uh, in a world where there are no causes, anything can happen and for no reason at all. But there's another reason why some believe, like myself, in the principle of causation, and that is that I believe it is a, a basic principle of rationality that we know by means of rational intuition. There are a number of things that we know this way. I think it's um, in the category of something that is red all over cannot be green all over. We know that, too. But we haven't examined all the red things, to be sure. We don't have to examine all the red things to be sure that anything that's red all over is not green all over. I think it's similar uh, that we know the principle of causation that I'm referring to in much the same way. Not empirically only, but by means of a rational intuition that we have of its truth. Uh, I have nothing further to add. Please ask your question. Yes. Um, my question is in regard to the ambiguity of God, because um, you look around the world, there's so many different religions, uh, to too many to count. And, and, and um, I, I guess my question is just, why was God so, uh, excuse the layman, stupid to send mixed messages to people all over the earth? Because... You, you ask anyone, even of the same religion, they'll give you a different version of what they think of God or the afterlife or whatever. So you could go into the free will argument, but I just don't see... Listen, you're a young guy, and I'm reluctant to say this, but I do think that it's inappropriate to say stupid in a context like this. True, absolutely. Okay? Um, simply because uh, if we're going to have an exchange of ideas, all right, we should respect each other's position. <laughs> And, uh, and I'm trying to do that here. Now, look, uh, a lot of these questions have been questions like, well, if God exists, then why this and why that? And why would he think this? And why would he allow that? But uh, I can think uh, almost anybody I know does something I can't explain. And I don't, I don't have to know. I don't know how to find out. Um, maybe if I ask them, they'll explain it to me. Maybe they won't be able to explain it to me because I'm too dense. I'm stupid. <laughs> All right? But uh, I just don't know why we ask questions like that so much when we haven't answered the more fundamental questions like, so what does explain the origin of the universe if it's not God? Now, once we come to the conclusion that God does exist, well, then by all means, let's go to these questions and think, okay, now if God exists, now that we think such a thing, um, what are we supposed to make of this other stuff? But that kind of question doesn't really give me a reason to think there is no God. Uh, okay. uh, the question of why uh, revelations disagree, why religions make so many different claims about what God wants, and what God is, and so forth and so on. Uh, again, to repeat, it's more easily explained, I think, on my naturalistic uh, hypothesis. I think far more important than looking to the cacophony of revelation, which as a totality, it couldn't even be really called even a body of evidence either way. That's too generous. Instead, I respect the intellectual pursuit of looking at the evidence that we collectively can agree upon and then seeing what reasonable inferences can or cannot be made from there. So I guess that's sort of in general sympathy with, with what Doug wanted to say about our methods tonight. One final, final question. Question. Yeah. question. My question is, uh, I heard John say earlier in his talk that he has a certain humility with which he looks at science and his studies of naturalism and so forth. I presume, Doug, you would have the same kind of humility as you look at religious studies and in terms of philosophy. A couple of things. My question is going to be that there was an article in the Buffalo News about a week or two ago that said basically that one-third of all recognized scientists truly believe in God. That's the first part. And it said 83% of American people truly believe in God. As a humble scientist, and as a humble religionist, 
Do you not place some faith in those scientists who do believe in God? Are they not bright intellectual people who have grasped and embraced a faith that takes them beyond the purely natural? And do you place any stock in scientists who have given, through their faith in Christianity, have given us the foundations of science? I'm thinking of people like Copernicus and Galileo and people like that. And can you not, with humility, respect the science that is exegesis of scriptures, which is, is such a science, as well as theology being a science itself? There are so many incredible, intelligent authors who take apart the mystery of God in so many kinds of ways, um, and they try to challenge us to realize that no matter who we are, scientists or religionists, none of us has all the answers. So my bottom line question is, don't you have some trust and faith in the dignity and respect that should be offered to the 83% of people in the country that believe in God and those one-third scientists who also do? They are as bright and as intelligent as both of you. And don't you trust in the, in the humanity of believing people? Are, are they stupid? I'll use the word stupid now. Are all those people stupid? You are confusing intelligence with the capacity to apply that intelligence the questions that require serious specialization. Doug said he's not a theologian. I'm not a theologian. But we are discussing theological arguments that can get incredibly sophisticated and dense and, quite frankly, require such specialization. You gave another example, that of scriptural exegesis. I have enormous respect for scriptural exegesis. I wish there were more of it. It tends to lead to a very liberal, non-dogmatic, and non-literalist understanding of our religious histories. I respect that. What I do not respect is somehow somebody saying, just because somebody is smart in one area, that they are know-it-all in all other areas. That is an unintelligent conclusion. It's an argument from wrong authority, and I don't buy it. Faith is not uh, you know, necessarily the correct application of intelligence. I'm not saying faith is unintelligent. I await really good intelligent explanations for faith. If I heard them, I would not be an atheist. Now, you don't have to take my word for it. This whole debate is an invitation to consider the arguments on their merits. Scientists have that opportunity. You have that opportunity. What I do not respect is somebody saying, my faith comes first, and then I'm going to go look for the evidence and interpretation that backs up my prior faith. That I will never respect, and I suspect that anybody who tries to pull that on you is not respecting your intelligence either. Uh, John, I don't think our guest uh, said that these were know-it-all people or thought of themselves in that way. But I thought he was saying something very different than that. Um, it is impressive that there are intellectuals across the disciplines, not just the sciences. In my field in philosophy, there has been a surge of philosophers coming into the universities who are not only theists but Christians. Uh, one of the largest uh, societies in philosophy in North America is the Society of Christian Philosophers. And uh, this, this is obviously something that atheists have to reckon with. Quentin Smith, one of our colleagues at another university, is a naturalist, an atheist. He has written an article in which he has warned naturalists that they have not prepared themselves for the uh, surge of theistic uh, philosophers and the powerful arguments that they have been making. That naturalists have simply been too casual because they've thought that they were the only ones controlling the ivory tower. Well, that's changing. And because that's changing, uh, there are going to be more events just like this. So I think uh, it is evidence of the kind of uh, respect that you're talking about that John has invited me to come. Uh, and, and participate in this. What does surprise me, though, is um, his, it, what seems to be his, his tendency to convey the impression that there is zero evidence for the existence of God, or that it's, very, it's so low it's not even considerable. And that, I think, is prima facie implausible precisely because they're intelligent people who've developed the evidence and developed the arguments. One last thing about humility. Intellectual humility is not just a matter of being skeptical. In fact, sometimes intellectual humility requires belief in something because the evidence is ample, even if you don't want to believe it. 
On that note, we want to thank our debaters for putting on this marvelous discussion tonight. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thanks. We want to thank all of you for attending because what you heard tonight was a debate on what may truly be the most important question really facing the world today. And on behalf of the Center for Inquiry, once again, I want to thank you for your presence here tonight. Thank you.